We're moving away from South Africa. These are from the United Kingdom, and they say baby food from six months. So these would be foods that you would wean your child onto. The next food, soft cooked meats such as chicken, mashed fish, also full dairy product, full fat dairy products such as yogurt, fromage, fra, or custard, and whole milk can be used. So again, the UK guidelines are not too different because they also include weaning the children onto meat-based diet with lots of fat. It's also important to see what ADSA is saying, and they will tend to reflect what are the South African dietary guidelines. And in fact, they use many of the same words. But again, it's important for, for the case that we should see what is ADSA's opinion on this. So they quote the guidelines on suitable complementary foods written by Duplessis et al., which we went through at great length. So they are obviously confirming that they agree with those dietary guidelines. And in a sense, they are very much what we've already heard, but it's important to put it on record. So provide a variety of foods to ensure that nutrient needs are met. This includes vegetables, fruit, whole grains, meat and meat alternatives, etc. Meat, poultry, fish, eggs, legumes, nuts, seeds and nut butters and dairy produce from the age of 12 months in addition to but not replacing breast milk. And then again, they mentioned foods from animals, meat, poultry, fish or eggs should be eaten daily or as, if, as often as possible. And they warn against the role of vegetarian diets because they aren't nutrient dense enough for the, for the growing infant. And again, it's dark green leafy vegetables and so on, and then provide diets with an adequate fat content. So here's ADSA saying that you must make sure the fat content of the diet is adequate and they offer plant foods, vegetable oils, avocado, nut butters, and I'll show you that vegetable oils is, is incorrect advice, that avocado, nut butters, and foods from animals are fine. So again, the emphasis is on the eating of animal produce supplemented by fats from avocados, nut butters, and vegetable oils, but we'll address the vegetable oil issue later on. And here are the new South African food-based dietary guidelines, and these are written by Professor Forster, who is obviously in the audience, or sorry, in the complainant's expert witness. So it's really important to see what, what she has to say and whether they differ from what I've said. And so it's important that she obviously gives lots of guidelines, but I'm focusing on the 6 to 12 months. So she says, at six months, start giving your infant small amounts of complementary foods while continuing to breastfeed to two years and beyond. And that is the guideline that we also give in raising superheroes. So you gradually increase the amount of food, the number of feeds and variety, and then you feed slowly and patiently, etc. But here's the key. From six months of age, give your child meat, fish, chicken, fish, meat, chicken, fish or egg every day or as often as possible. And so these are exactly the same as the Duplessis et al. guidelines, but that's coming from, from the complainant's expert witness. And then she also says, give your child dark green leafy vegetables and orange colored vegetables and fruit every day. And I disagree with the fruit, but that's not the, what we're really arguing. So a lot of people ask me, so what is the low carbohydrate, high fat diet that you propose? And it's really very simple. And it's a matter of just, as I said on one of the first days, is you simply take the Real Meal Revolution and you open it on the page, which is the green page. And this is specifically why we developed the green page. And these are the foods that we think it's healthy for you to eat. So that is the green page directly out of, of the book Real Meal Revolution. And in the book, it's page 47, the 47 of the Real Meal Revolution. And this is the basis, if you're going to judge this diet, and you're going to find it wanting, then you have to say that the foods on the green page are inappropriate and unhealthy. And we've just said, there, and there's the green page, and Professor Forster has said that we must eat meat, chicken, fish, or eggs every day or as often as possible. And, and sorry, and the question is, do they appear on the green list? And there they all are. On the left, it says all meat, poultry and game, all legs, all offal. And those are what I've listed on the left and on the right hand side are the vegetables. So, so the green list passes the classification of what is appropriate according to the ADSA dietary guidelines as written by the expert witness, Professor Foster. So I think that we should be comfortable 
that the expert witness for ADSA has said that the foods that are on the green list are what we should be eating. And then we have, again, her dietary guidelines written by Professor Forster. And these are published in the South African Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And this is the introduction. So this is the, in a sense, an important paper because it introduces these ideas. Again, it's Professor Forster is the first author with two other authors. And it's probable that she's going to repeat what she's written in the ADSA guidelines. And, and the point I read, this, this, this is the paper that as a scientist you would read. You wouldn't read the ADSA guidelines. I happen to find them. But you would read this. So this is what as a scientist you'd be reading, writing, sorry, reading. Because this is published in a peer-reviewed journal. And so these would be what has got to stand the test of time. And again, she says, from the six months of age, give your baby meat, chicken, fish, or eggs every day or as often as possible. <laughs> And I make the point again on the next page that, that that is what the green list contains. So exactly what she says, that is on the green list, listed there. Her guidelines were give your child dark green leafy vegetables, orange colored vegetables and fruit every day. And as far as the vegetables go, there they are. That's the definition. So. She might as well have said, go and read the green list in the Real Meal Revolution because that's what the guidelines, guidelines state. So now those are South African guidelines. So let's look at the World Health Organization because often we, our guidelines might reflect what they are, what the World Health Organization, or they might be slightly different. So it's important that we should consider, and these we considered when I drew up the guidelines and I wrote the book, I read the World Health Organization guidelines as I read all the other guidelines that I've given you, presented to you, I've discovered these articles, I found them and I read them. And then I included them in our book. So these are the principles for feeding non-breastfed children. So these are children who have already stopped breastfeeding, which at six months is too early, but nevertheless. Meat, poultry, fish or eggs should be eaten daily or as often as possible. So in fact, the South African guidelines and the ADSA guidelines reflect exactly the World Health Organization. In fact, the words are the same. But they add, because they're rich sources of many key nutrients such as iron and zinc. And then they say milk products are rich sources of calcium and several, several other nutrients. And then, important, diets that do not contain animal sourced foods cannot meet all nutrient needs at this age. So again, it seems to me that as a person writing a book on infant feeding, I must be, expo I must be focusing and promoting what the World Health Organization says, what the South African guidelines say, and they say animal source foods. Because if you don't eat them, you can't meet all nutrition needs at, any, at this age, except if you use supplements which are nutrient uh, fortified. Then they focus on fat on this particular page, fat content. Fat is important in the diets of infants and young children because it provides fa essential fatty acids and essential fatty acids are the fatty acids that you cannot make in the body, and there are some which you have to eat in the diet. It facilitates the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, and this is a point that is never made, that if you're eating a, a fat-deficient diet, you can't absorb the fat-soluble vitamins D, E, A, and K. And that may have long-term consequences, and it enhances dietary energy density and sensory qualities. Although there is debate about the optimal amount of fat in the diets of infants and young children, the range of 30 to 45 percent has been suggested as a reasonable compromise between the risks of too little intake and excessive intake. And I'll come to excessive intake. But 30 to 45 percent would be classified by dietitians in South Africa as a high fat diet. So this is a high fat diet, which again was what I was promoting. And you see the excessive intake is thought to potentially increase the likelihood of childhood obesity. We've shown that that is not true. I've shown you the, the previous studies that fat intake in children is not linked to childhood obesity. Protein intake is. And if you have insulin resistance, I would argue that carbohydrates become the main driver of obesity. And future cardiovascular disease, although the evidence to the point is limited, my emphasis is there's no evidence. There's no evidence that fat intake in children increases their risk of heart disease. That is speculation based on the old model, the diet heart model, which I hope we've kind of destroyed, but we will certainly destroy by tomorrow. So again, here are the guidelines from this document. Feed a variety of foods to ensure that nutrient 
needs are met. And again, meat, poultry, fish or eggs should be eaten daily or as often as possible. And vegetarian diets can't, cannot meet nutrient needs, etc., etc., etc. So I apologize for being so repetitious, but it seems to be the same story comes out every time. If you read the literature, they say exactly what, what I'm promoting. And again, there's the argument that vegetarian diets, because they lack the, the, the animal-based sources of nutrients, cannot meet nutrient needs. And again, this is the micronutrient content of the diet. And they're arguing again that if we go right to the bottom, because this is more technical, we don't need to worry about it. Given the relatively small amounts of complementary foods that are consumed at between 6 to 24 months, so that after you've stopped or you're weaning onto, onto these foods, the nutrient density amount of each nutrient per 100 kilocalories of food, of complementary foods, needs to be very high. And again, I emphasize, as I will show you, that nutrient-dense foods are of animal basis. Nutrient-dense foods are not in found in grains and cereals and vegetables. The nutrient-dense foods are the foods from animal sources. And again, we get the story that in developing countries like South Africa, complementary foods often don't provide sufficient iron, zinc, and vitamin B6 because they're not true complementary foods. That's the point. They are fortified cereals and grains, which are not true complementary foods. And again, they focus on, even in the US, iron and zinc were identified as problem nutrients in the first year of life, despite the availability of, of iron-fortified products. So even, again, for iron-fortified products, which are not truly complementary foods. Certain nutrients are in short supply in some populations, but not in all, depending on the local mix, etc., etc., etc. So again, the point being that the complementary foods have got to be animal sourced if they're going to have sufficient zinc and iron and to some extent vitamin B6. And they go further and say that it's clear from analyses done before that plant-based complementary foods by themselves are insufficient to meet the needs of certain micronutrients. And again, they repeat, therefore it's advisable to include meat, poultry, fish or eggs in complementary food diets as often as possible. And they say dairy produce is also beneficial but it doesn't provide enough iron. So you still have to, have, even if you're on dairy, you still have to have iron from, from animal sources. And again, to be repetitious, fat content is focused. They focus on fat content. Fat is important in the diets of infants and young children because it provides essential fatty acids, facilitates absorb absorption of fat-soluble vitamins and enhances dietary energy density and sensory qualities. That's what the food tastes like. So again, the focus, promotion of fat in the diet. Fat is not seen as an enemy, it's seen as essential. And again, we get to this range of what's the optimum range of fat intake for a child or for an infant. And there's a debate about the op optimal amount of fat in the diet of infants and young children, but the range of 30 to 45% of total energy has been suggested as a reasonable compromise. And we've been through this, that if you have two Little you won't develop properly, but if you have too much, you'll get cardiovascular disease. But there's utterly no evidence for that. So I will show you that the guidelines, the new dietary guidelines coming out recently, indicate that in adults, there's no reason to restrict the total fat intake. And therefore, there's no reason in children to restrict the total fat intake because it's not linked to obesity. We know it's not linked to cardiovascular disease, or it's not proven to be linked to cardiovascular disease. So this limit of 30 to 45% is constrained by these people's concerns that fat causes heart disease. But we now, we're free of that constraint. So therefore, there's no reason why that range has to be described. They could say there's no upper limit to the total fat intake for a child or an infant. They haven't got there yet because they still... Notice these guidelines are in advance of what we, we were telling adults up till very recently. We would never have said 45% of the total energy in the diet is safe. We're saying it is safe 45% of the children. I'm saying that because heart disease is not linked to fat in the diet, I don't understand why you have to put that upper limit at 45%. And it may well be that if we fed our children more fat, they'd be healthier. But that's a speculation. Then we go to Canada, and the Canadian 
well, Canadian Pediatric Society, Dietitians of Canada and the Breastfeeding Committee for Canada produced these the guidelines. So it's not just one group, it's got a group of doctors and others advising and they come to these conclusions. And these were one of the first, and I can't see the date, but I think it was probably two years ago when they brought up these guidelines. And they said maintaining adequate iron is essential to infant growth and cognitive, neurological, motor and behavioral development. Iron is a critical nutrient in brain development deficiencies during infancy and childhood may have serious and irreversible effects. And again, where do you find iron? You find it in produce from animals. And now they focus on the problem because Canada is interesting because it has its First Nation populations who are incredibly healthy, like the Plains Indians, were incredibly healthy when they were eating their traditional foods. And then along came the processed foods and got into these communities and their health di diminished and obesity and diabetes became prevalent. And now they're trying to reverse that, realizing that, that it was introduction of processed foods that caused the problem. So here they refer to that, while meat and fish are traditional first foods for some Aboriginal groups. So they're referring to the First Nations of Canadians who lived on fish by and large because they lived in the far Arctic, in the far north, and that's what they ate. The common practice in North America has been to introduce infant cereals, vegetables and fruit as the first complementary foods. However, the daily or frequent consumption of heme iron foods, meat, poultry and fish can contribute considerably to meeting infant iron requirements. Infants should be offered iron containing foods two or more times each day. And there you go. So they're saying not once a day, actually two or three times a day, they should be served meat, fish, poultry or meat alternatives. So that's the evidence from Canada and from the World Health Organization and from the United Kingdom, exactly what I've said, that we've got to focus on nutrient-dense foods from animal sources. When infants are weaned to meat rather than cereals, they show greater growth in length without any increase in adiposity, and that is one of the Krebs paper which we'll discuss. They also consume, consume three times as much zinc and show a significant higher rate of growth of head circumference, and that's critical. Head circumference and how quickly it grows in the first thousand days is criti critically important in developing, determining sorry, what we will become. Weaning onto eggs improves infant blood DHA, an important omega-3 fatty acid with its name, and iron levels. In other studies, this more rapid brain growth after birth predicts higher intelligence. That's, that's a terribly important study, that, that if we want to develop children with intelligence, we need to feed them properly from birth. In evolutionary terms, meat, particularly organ tissues, would provide the ideal weaning food, and that's reference 46. Even our own South African guidelines acknowledge as much, or were at least on track to do so, as noted earlier. In fact, I've shown you that they have done that. They are the broad principles at which I think these guidelines fall down, and here are specific failures, and I talk about some of the problems I had with those guidelines, but we're not focusing on those now. And I don't think it's really relevant. It is there. Um, the, my concerns, we'll talk about them, is that wheat contains gluten, and the effects on gluten and our health are only just being recognized. That in the past, as pediatricians, we, we, sorry, we were taught, taught by the pediatricians that gluten is a very important cause in celiac disease, which is a prevalent problem in Ireland and from some other countries and it's a life-threatening disease but once you take the gluten out of the diet they do very well but that's not the only disease that gluten is involved with and we have this condition non-celiac gluten sensitivity and I'm going to go through that at great length because that is a condition that is much more prevalent than we recognize and no dietary guidelines in the world address the incidence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity as an issue for dietary guidelines which are based on promoting cereals and grains as healthy because they can't be healthy for that population that has non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So this is the point I made there. The traditional weaning of infants onto white or even brown rice cereal is not based on some magical nutritional value exclusive to rice cereals without which infants will not survive, thrive. And I've given you all the evidence that if you were to wean your children only onto these foods, those children will not thrive. The evidence is abundantly clear they're not going to get enough protein, fats, <coughs> zinc, iron that they need to develop. Rather, it's because that is what Gerber, 
the food company decided was good for babies some eight decades ago. The reality is that rice cereal is a nutritionally deficient foodstuff that contains little other than cheap non-essential carbohydrates. Its popularity has been sustained because of the perception that it's a safe foodstuff that is unlikely to produce allergies and because it is easily digestible and thus more suitable for premature weaning. More recently, it has the added perceived benefit of being low in fat, which supposedly causes heart disease. So that's part of the, the drive as well. This fallacious idea that fat in the diet is dangerous because it causes heart disease, so cereals must be good. So that's what we got from the adults. We took it to the children. If we're going to prevent heart disease, they must eat carbohydrates and they must eat cereals and grains.